it's just not working so I've got to try something new so having that session with Amar and then changing my mindset I think I was just having a think and just to reflect um, I just remembered some of the times that I have been grateful in the past and I have struggled with anxiety and stuff previously and I remember with that that the gratitude part of it kind of negates all anxiety for me as well so just kind of went back to those kind of basics really um, as much as we go back to the cricket basics I think the, the mental basics are really really key in life and a bit of perspective at the end of the day. G'day legends and welcome back to another episode of the Cricket Mentoring Podcast. We're coming to you from a sort of sunny, sort of overcast <laughs> Woodlands Cricket Club in Bradford and I have a special guest with me, Marie Kelly. Marie, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on and the so, sun's out. So Marie's a professional cricketer. She's on her way to Leeds where she's going to be spending the next month or so yeah. for the 100. Tell us about what's coming up next for you. So much fun, first of all. Uh, the 100 is... Um, one of the, the most fun competitions around um, for myself as a player. There's loads of stuff kind of on and off the pitch too. So there's a lot about kind of inspiring the next generation off the pitch. So there's loads of kind of content stuff that we do. And then obviously the, the actual game itself is really high, high paced and really fast and, and fun. So yeah, a lot of fun coming up next three weeks. Yes. And so you're with the Northern Superchargers. I am. And tell us what the next, so when's the first game? So we're on, on Friday, so I think we're one of the, the later games. So I'm literally going from here to, to the hotel to meet up with everyone. A couple of training sessions, get to know everyone again, and then and then we're on on Friday. So we're privileged to have Marie today in her busy schedule. She's going to come and have a hit with me after this. And I got to know Marie uh, very well during the Perth summer, where okay. she came out for with her partner Tom for um, a good few months, and we worked together. Now let's go back to the very beginning. I yeah. like to start this at the start. Um, tell us about your first cricketing memory. Um, I think it all revolves around food for me. So um, <laughs> as most people who know me know, it's know it's about that. But we we first went to Ellswood Cricket Club, which is our local cricket club. Um, we played tennis first, actually me and my twin sister. And we played against a famous cricketer's daughter, so Trevor Penny, his daughter. And he recommended this local club, Ellswood. And we went and they had a tuck shop on, on a Friday night. And we basically just did ball games on, on the pitch, cartwheels, whatever you wanted. And then there was loads of competitions where... You could win 50p and you could win the sweets for the for the end of the night. Um, and then we'd always go for fish and chips as well after after the training session. So our parents loved it because it was basically just childcare in a field. Um, where That's they pretty common some, in Friday yeah. night, cults <laughs> yeah, Friday here nights, in England. Friday nights, let your kids loose. Um, parents enjoy the bar. Yeah, parents loved the bar. They made great friends with everyone at the club. They were so welcoming. I think we were, I think we were the only girls, maybe a few of the girls at the time, um, and yeah, this tuck shop was amazing, and then fish and chips as well on a Friday night. So, what's not to love? So, how did you then get? How did you then fall in love with the game of cricket, not just the tuck shop? Well, I think because we played tennis, tennis was um, still quite competitive at an early age for girls. So, we did like okay, but we didn't. We weren't that successful. And I think when you then went to cricket and you were kind of the only girls, it was probably the attention was probably a big part of it. Um, you got quite a lot of immediate success. So immediately we, we got trials at Warwickshire and immediately got in because there just weren't many girls playing cricket. So almost instantly you, you're representing your county in a sport. And I think when anyone's told that their child or you as a child are told you're really good at something, go and play this and you get to represent your county and you get to miss days of school and things like that, you've immediately got that success. And then there was only probably 11 of us training at the time. So you get quite a lot of um, coach to child kind of ratio. So I feel like we just improved really quickly as well. Um, so I think when you've got that immediate success, it drives you to want to go back and, and continue to do it. Yep. And then tell us about progressing in teenage years and, and when did you start playing more girls cricket as opposed to probably playing a lot with the boys? Yeah, so it was pretty much all, all boys to start with. Um, then we played, obviously, throughout the age group with boys cricket. We then moved clubs to Mosey Cricket Club where we played women's cricket. There wasn't a girls team back then. It just didn't exist, which is one of the crazy things um, now. So it was, it was a women's team which had sort of 40-year-olds, 25-year-olds, 30-year-olds, a few 15-year-olds, as, as in us. Um, but we played men's cricket as well throughout that whole time. So our week was sort of under-15 boys cricket as well as women's and sort of any other cricket we could get our hands on. So we were probably playing five, six, seven times a week. And really. being, being a twin, were you and your sister always competing with each other? Uh, yeah, probably, naturally. Um, we did different roles, so she was a wicketkeeper. Um, and I was a seamer back then. Yep. I was a, a fast bowler, if you, <laughs> if you will, fast as a good, um, and, and a batter as well. Uh, so I guess we weren't actually competing too much because it was always 
I might snick someone off and she'd take it. So it's almost like a joint a joint thing together. Yeah, that and would then have been cool. Yeah, and then when we batted together, we kind of almost had that kind of twin telepathy thing where we didn't really need to call too much. We kind of just look at each other and knew when we could run and stuff. And batting with her probably helped because we were pretty similar in kind of speed and stuff like that. So we kind of helped each other, I guess, rather than being too competitive. And so then what point did you start to think that you could make this a career? Because still then we're talking you're 15. Uh, I won't yeah. give away your age too much. <laughs> but um, over 10 years ago, um, the, the game, the women's game wasn't as professional as it is now. Obviously, right. there wasn't the 100, there wasn't the blast. Like, what, what was it like thinking about playing professional cricket then? Yeah, it just just wasn't really a thing the only way that you could be professional in women's cricket was to play for England so I think that was always the goal was to play for England it was never I don't think I ever kind of wrote down I want to be a professional cricketer it was just I just want to go as far as I can in this and I was on the Warwickshire Men's Academy and stuff so got some real high level coaching from them and I just wanted to were, the, were, the, were you the only female yeah yeah on that which again was tough and there was a lot of kind of almost like red ball training I guess so um yeah a lot of different skills but I think like the fitness and we'll probably get onto it like the mentality side and the resilience and all that kind of stuff I was kind of really well coached in in all of that so I think that prepared me nicely to be a pro cricketer even though at that point I didn't really know that's what it was preparing me for um, and then the biggest kind of shift towards professionalism was at Loughborough University where I did sports science but our program was run by a woman called Sally Ann Briggs who um, she played cricket and was actually um, the director of cricket at Hobart Hurricanes as well um, later on in her career but she had a really good network of women's cricket at Loughborough University it was basically all of the England girls were there um, so I went to university there for the university but also for the cricket and that's where I was like I want to be a professional cricketer here but when I left uni you still couldn't it was still two or three years after that that they had this change in women's regional cricket and the chance the chance arose. So then tell us about that journey and that change from university and mm. maybe playing at the highest level but not earning enough to be a pro and and you had to do other things tell us about that yeah it was it was tough we probably trained harder than I do now as a professional without the without the pay and you almost because you're working around everything else you're getting up even earlier finishing later like that was a tougher part of my life because you're trying to do a degree at the same time as well um I did actually drop out in second year of playing cricket because I, like, I can't do both I can't try and get a first class degree and be a professional cricketer I can't do it and then had two months without doing it and I thought, no, this is boring, I want, I want to go back to doing it. So I think when you step away, you kind of realise what you were missing. But Sorry, did you step away from cricket or from studies? Yeah, cricket. Okay. Yeah, because I, I wanted to, I didn't want to do mediocre in both. I didn't want to finish not having done as much as I could in my degree and then be kind of in the middle somewhere with cricket. I was like, I think I need to choose one of them here. Um, and I think a lot of women are still in that position where they're not quite on, on or they're on the fringe. You kind of have to choose between that but um yeah just missed it too much and I think I actually was like okay I'll maybe I'll, I will prefer these 6am gym sessions again and went back into it and, and at that time there was a, a franchise competition the KSL the Kia Super League um so there was still kind of that to play on but that was like I think a grand or two in summer to play and that was kind of the the closest bit to professionalism then that you could achieve and so then when did it change? Tell us about that. And tell us a bit about now into what it's like for a professional female now. Yeah, so I think two years after I finished university, they introduced um, women's professional contracts. Uh, two or three years after, I guess, um, where they, they introduced at eight regions. Um, so it wasn't county cricket like men's cricket is here. They almost combined the counties and had eight regions, um, which I think was probably the, the right thing in terms of getting the right number of professional players and they kind of eased it in with five professional contracts per team of which I was one of those um, for the Central Sparks which was the Warwickshire um, region um, and that that was great that was a almost like a first step into doing it where it was professional it was full-time but it was sort of two or three days a week most girls still had jobs on the side but it was like a I think that actually worked really well for us it wasn't just chucked in at the deep end it was almost like a step in and an easing and we I think we learn over the first couple of years to be professional cricketers yeah lovely lovely and so then the hundred that's revolutionized the female game yeah absolutely like from so we had sort of five professional contracts then everybody um for a couple of years and then the hundred came in uh, just after covid i think it was so that was just un unbelievable for us um it's the first time i think we've had the same level of marketing same level of advertisement and um, the same kind of production same hotels everything is what the men would normally get um, 
and then the results have kind of spoken for themselves on the pitch. Everybody's loved the women's competition as much as the men's. Um, the success has been huge and it's rewarded us as players financially as well. So it's kind of a it's a win-win. Uh, it means that I think a lot of us now don't have to work separate jobs. We can just fully commit to being professional cricketers and then the standard has then increased significantly, which has then brought in more revenue for, for the 100 and made the competition even better. So it's been a real good shift for women's cricket. I'm just pausing there, just try and not bang. Sorry, we can okay. get up. That's all right, that's all right, <laughs> just try and not bang. Um, and the other important part of it is you're inspiring the next generation, aren't you? Because as yeah. you said at the top, like, you've got young girls now saying, I want to do that. Yeah, massively. Like, I see um, girls on Instagram and kind of social media as well. I see kind of, you know, when you're at school and they write what they want to be when they're older and girls are actually writing, I want to be a professional cricketer. And that just wasn't a thing for us to even conceive back then. So... That's really cool. I see a lot of girls on my Instagram page kind of saying how much they're inspired and I see them trying to reverse sweep because they've seen me play it at the weekend and I just think that's really, really cool and I just love that and that's exactly what um, what we're here to do. Oh, good on you. Well, there's a lot of young girls out there trying to be Marie Kelly. Who were you trying to be when you were growing up? Who were your idols or um, people you looked up to? Um, I'd say initially it was probably men's cricketers because I probably first started watching cricket in the 2005 Ashes. So like Freddie Flintoff, people like that were just my heroes. Like I absolutely loved Freddie. What an Ashes uh, series. That yeah, was exactly. Yeah. yeah, I just remember sitting at like a family event and we were all just sat around watching it. And for yeah, like a nine-year-old girl to be interested in cricket, that's what 2005 Ashes did um, for our country and for me. So yeah, initially probably some, some men's cricketers like Freddie and then when he started to get to know some of the England women, people like Charlotte Edwards, Lydia Greenway, like really looked up to, to them and everything that um, Lottie's done for the game has been huge. So she was probably somebody that I looked up to, especially as a, as a batter back then too. What about mentors? Who have been the influential people? Where obviously our business is cricket mentoring and I'm trying to be the mentor I wish I had. So who have been the people that have had a big impact on your career? Gosh, I've had absolutely loads. I've been really, really... Lucky, I guess. Um, growing up at Warwickshire, I've had a lot of really good coaches. Think back in the day at Earlswood Cricket Club. Initially, there was sort of John Snipe, Dave Snipe, the whole Snipe family were unbelievable for me. Um, Phil McGovern, or everyone that just treated us as cricketers, not just a girl that played cricket. We, they just treated us equal, and I think that was really, really important. And then going through the Warwickshire pathway, Kelly Evenson was the first female coach that I had, and. She was really in instrumental in my development throughout the Warwickshire Academy. Like I said, Sally Ann Briggs at Loughborough University really spearheaded kind of the high performance of women's cricket and took it from that amateur to professional. And then I'd say kind of now, Tom, my partner, he's massive in kind of almost like the professional stuff with me and really supportive. And obviously we joke a bit a lot of the time that when you come home, it's cricket as well. But he fundamentally understands what I'm going through every single day. Um, he throws so many balls at me and any any issues that I've got, like I'll go to him. Um, tell, tell us about Tom, because those watching won't know. Tell us what he does and his background as well. Yeah, so Tom, Tom's done a lot of things <laughs> in his life. Um, he's currently the, the director of cricket at SACA, South Asian Cricket Academy, that he founded along with Kabir Ali um, off the back of his PhD research. So there was, I think a lot of you might have heard about kind of the institutional racism in, in English cricket and Tom was tasked with a PhD to kind of find out what that what that was all about. and ultimately it came down to that institutional racism so he set up SACA um, to provide opportunities for young South Asian players um, to go and earn professional contracts and super proud of what he does um, he's got a lot of players contracted so he does that and then supports me um, at the same time so he's got a lot of cricket going on in his life. Yeah so SACA is an amazing thing and we're going to try and get Tom on the pod at some point yeah. I got to know him as well um, during your time in Perth but Back to your mentors, who else has sort of played a big part? Yeah, so someone here in Bradford actually, Amar Rashid, so Deal Rashid's brother. Um, he, I've gone to him recently when I was going for a bit of a bad run of form too um, and he's helped me with a few technical bits and kind of the mental kind of side of the game and he's worked with a lot of players getting them out of bad ruts of form so I'll probably have a few sessions with him throughout the 100 as well and he's been really, really helpful too, sort of that high level and performance coach and then obviously yourself out in Perth too and drop that one in there um, just great to kind of talk and I'm a big believer in kind of just listening to a lot of people everyone's gone through so many experiences you've coached so many people Amal's coached so many and Tom through all his, his experiences at Saka as well has everyone has dealt with so many different issues that I think the more you can talk about it the better you don't have to listen to absolutely everything everyone says um, I think as long as you're doing it for yourself I'm not just doing it to please you or to please what Amar says but 
um, yeah, I think the more you can listen and filter what, what you need, then the more that's going to help. And so it's spot on. I couldn't agree any more. Is, um, for any young girl listening or boy, um, how important is it having that sort of mentor or mentors or group or circle around you supporting you as a, as a professional cricketer? Yeah, 100%. And I think, obviously, when we talk about network, you often think about like your family and friends. And, of course, you've got that as well. But I think sometimes you do need those people who have kind of been in that higher position and kind of higher performance and people who have lived and breathed it, um, people who know what you're going through. I think like you'll always go back to your parents and your family and they'll always support you, whatever, even if you scored no runs and stuff. But the people that I think if you can find somebody that can help you get out of a rut, whether it's a technical, physical, mental thing to do with your specific sport, then I think, yeah, that's huge for me. Absolutely. Now, you're moving into the 100 and that is juggling formats that's a that's a challenge i think men or women yeah. boys or girls um struggle with you play t20 cricket you play 50 over cricket and you play this new hundred yeah how do you go about that and do you change much mentally tactically technically um i think it's similar processes in in all i think it's still doing the same whatever works for you so i would do a lot of research before each game try and watch a lot of videos and things like that and I think that doesn't change whether it's T20, 50 over or, or the 100, so that's still the same. Um, the way I prep might be a bit different, so if it's the 100, you might be playing a few more expansive shots in the nets. Um, if it's 50 over cricket, I tend to try and almost go back to basics a little bit and just focus on the timing and, and balance and things like that and just watching the ball. Um, obviously, T20 and the 100, you might have to kind of invent things a little bit more, put a little bit more pressure on the bowlers and try a few more things, but... Ultimately, it doesn't really change too much. And I think white ball, I think it's more difficult for the men going T20 to county championship than back to T20. I think that would be really, really difficult. So we're lucky that it's just white ball cricket at the minute. And so on that white ball in the female game, do you think, like when I've seen the Ashes in the women, they all sort of say, I wish we had more test cricket. Where do you stand on that? What do you think, where do you think the female game should go? Should there be more red ball cricket? Yeah, I think so. I think it all depends what the ICC want. If there's going to be more test cricket globally, then we need to be playing it more um, domestically. Um, I think we would enjoy that. You might need to start with like two-day cricket. I think growing up, there's a lot of girls my age that have played a lot of Red Bull cricket with our men's cricket growing up, but there's youngsters now that have never seen a Red Bull or touched a Red Bull, so that would be asking a lot of them to compete at the highest level having never done that. Um, so we either need to fully commit to it and then commit to it domestically or you say is this right for the women's game yeah absolutely and I guess it's a juggle of bringing in new fans and mm. also challenging the girls and, and whatever revenue and everything that um let's move into our six pillars of success so I know having worked with you in Perth your technique is something you spend a lot of time on yeah. let's give us an insight into how you manage your technique and what how important that part of the game is for you yeah I think it's massive I think this year I tried to change it quite a bit. It was almost like I've known for a while that my left my left side is, is not very strong and um, I've got a few technical issues, but I've never really had the time to, to change them. Um, so this winter, like with, with yourself and with Tom out in Perth, tried to change quite a bit. And I think this year then I've struggled to score runs and it's probably off the back of that. And it's probably been a lesson to me of like, you might have to tinker, but I think big changes are, are quite hard and they take a lot of time and a lot of work. Um, I changed something technically in COVID, but we had two years effectively of you can hit as many balls as you want and that really worked. So that was great. So I think it's something that if you're going to change something quite big, you need to put in a lot of a lot of hours um, to make it work. And then throughout the season, I think I've done a few little tinkers that have really, really helped me. Um, a few things that Amar spotted and we had a guy over at the Blaze called Craig Cummings who came from New Zealand and he spotted a few things for me technically and that really helped me get out of a bad hole this summer. So sometimes it is your what mentality that my bat fit. I think when you get more tense, my bat had crept a lot more closer to me and obviously like you're tensing up your muscles and stuff. So then my bat face had come really close to me and open. So I was getting like, I was snicking off a lot. And even when I was driving, it was going in the air and like I never, I've never ever done that before. And Amar noticed that my face had opened quite a bit and Craig noticed that it was really, really close to me. So a combination of both of those and I just wasn't able to hit the ball exactly where I, I'd used to. So spent a lot of time with Amar kind of closing the face and getting back to just hitting straight down the ground again and suddenly started scoring lead runs again. Well, it's amazing. Like, technique is the foundation, I believe, of anyone, and it, it, it's what gives you the competence. Yeah. And I'm big on uh, competence over confidence. Yeah, 100%. Um, 
And so if there's things that are off in your technique and you're not hitting the ball well, yeah, you sort of, you don't feel competent and yeah. you're not going to, you're not going to be as competent. So little technical adjustments like that are, are crucial to manage your game. 100%. When you were younger and you were aspiring, was it mostly all about technique as a sort of a teenager and aspiring through the academy and stuff like that? Yeah, I think, I think that's the main difference I see now with the, the way that we're coaching youngsters and, and girls from coming through our academy that a lot of my cricket growing up or a lot of my training was kind of machine driving a lot of a lot of drives a lot of machine work a lot of hitting off the cone blah 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 and I think we do it a lot better now in terms of playing a lot more shots I think the girls kind of sweep as much as they drive they, they pull as much as they drive and I think that is really beneficial I think we were probably quite one-dimensional growing up and I think that's where I had a pretty heavy bat and it was just machine work and that's, I think I probably didn't get like the flow and the rhythm that, that we spoke about in, in Australia. So I think the more you can hit balls and make decisions, I think that's probably a lot better. I think I probably spent a lot of time growing up very technical and, and very like on the bowling machine and predicting where it's going to go and stuff. So I think it does have a, a place, but I think it's all about reacting to the ball at the end of the day. And the thing about the women's game, like I coach a lot of girls and obviously worked with you in this, in this Australian summer is that it's a lot slower than the men's game. Yep. So your technique isn't as important. Yeah. I, I say to players that when you're facing one 40 kilometres or 90 mile, everything has to move so efficiently yeah. to be able to get the bat down and play a good shot to that speed. But the mm. women's game slower. Yeah. So you can have a few kinks and it's more, you need to be able to put pace on the ball in the women's game, don't yeah. you? 100%. And do that in a low risk fashion. I think it's more about timing in, in women's cricket. And if you can time it, you don't need to over hit. I've obviously got a big bottom hand that comes out all the time because you're trying to over hit all the time um, and add that pace back onto the ball. But I do think the higher up you go, you still need to have that solid technical foundation. Otherwise you're going to get found out. Absolutely. And so what are the little things you're trying to manage in your technique at the moment? What are your little cues that are important to you right now? So mine is when I, when I look back, just making sure that my face isn't too open, um, that it's just slight, slightly closed and then just out to the side a little bit more. So facing more towards like a third slip kind of, kind of area. And then, I'm just able to hit straight and I find when I'm when I can hit straight and hit straight well that's my confidence kind of ticked off done if I can't access down the ground well I think that's when my confidence because my competence is lower I think that's where it kind of creeps in we're just taking a break from this episode for a minute to tell you about the cricket mentoring community we're on a mission to build the world's best community of cricketers coaches and parents so no matter where in the world you live or what level you're at right now the cricket mentoring community can help you. If you're committed to your game and serious about becoming the best cricketer you can be and person you can be off the field, then join cricketers from over 24 countries around the world in the cricket mentoring community. Get access to myself and other CM mentors and experts from around the world as we aim to teach you the six pillars of success, technical, tactical, mental, emotional, physical and lifestyle so that you can become the best you can be. If this excites you and you're ready to take the next step in your journey, then click on the link in the description below and join the Cricket Mentoring community now. So we spoke a few weeks ago after you had some success. You played a really great match-winning innings and you said that there was another thing you'd done working with Amar around moving late. Yeah, so he just said I was moving way too early for the ball. Um, I think when you're not scoring runs as well, like you're searching for things, you're searching for a half volley, you're searching for a short ball, whatever it might be. Um, and so we, we just went back to real basics, did kind of no uh, no footwork kind of drill where you just looked at the length and played it with your, played it with your arms um, and that really helped me get back into some form. So, yeah, and we, we did that in Australia as well and I think it's something I probably forgot about or when you're getting wrapped up with not scoring runs, just going back to the basics of picking the length and, and responding to that. And, yeah, cricket was a lot easier after that. <laughs> and it's amazing, like, watch the ball. People think that means... Uh, your eyes being on the yeah. ball but everyone watches the board so really about having clarity of yeah. thought isn't it's like it? what that means to you and for me that's been what length is it because I think once you like you've got all the shots and a lot of people do you have all the shots in the book but it's can you execute them at the right time and not looking for not looking for things to put away um just reacting um there and then and the better you react and then you execute on those reactions and and that's that's scoring runs yeah and you can only make good decisions and react if you're quite clear and when you're not scoring runs you're often think tinkering looking for answers yeah. you get really clouded don't you 100 percent. and i feel like you just don't feel like you're you're in you don't feel like you can watch the ball so even though i knew i, I knew kind of off the pitch that i wanted to watch the ball but it was like like how how do i how do i actually do that i think we can often just say oh well watch the ball but it's like 
to to what point. So that was a real clear kind of direction that I could I could take it and something really kind of tangible to look at. Go pick the length and and respond from there. And um, giving your mind one focus as opposed yeah. to many. Yeah. And actually, there was a um, I think that Rupert Hallows' his dad said. I think I messaged you as well about it that the brain responds better when you ask it ask itself a question and that really helped me of me going instead of telling yourself like watch the ball watch the ball watch the length blah 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 you get a bit tense it was like okay where's the ball where's the ball so that's kind of my kind of process now is as the ball is running in it's where's the ball pick the length where's the ball pick the length and it's just it helps me kind of relax and and yeah and hopefully execute a bit better well that that's a great sort of lead into our next uh, segment of mental and you made the you had the great innings, so you were having a tough season yeah. by your own standards, and you made the 89 off 63 for the Blaze versus the Central Sparks in the middle of June, and then we t- I sort of touched base just before that, checked in how you're doing, and you said not great, and then mm-hmm. we spoke afterwards, and there was a significant shift you made, which you've told me, and I'd love you to please share now about your mindset and what changed in the lead up to that game. Yeah, so um, there was a lot kind of behind the scenes of kind of contract negotiations as well that was going on that um it was for the first time I think we've been kind of given values as cricketers and there was a lot going on with that and there's a lot of I wasn't scoring runs other people were scoring runs girls were getting these offers other girls were scoring runs and I just felt really kind of bitter and angry and like why aren't I scoring runs blah 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 and everything was just getting I was just getting quite stressed and angry at the whole situation and then I kind of just flipped it and thought okay well let's flip it into a positive Blaze still want to offer me a contract even though I've scored no runs like how lucky am I that they want to offer me a contract like how lucky am I to still be a professional cricketer still get to open the bat in still get to do this um, and it just helped me relax um, and just enjoy playing cricket again and then contract stuff was all sorted as well I think that was a big part of it and then I was just able to go and do I think the combination with that and then just one thing of picking the length um, and then it all just kind of came together. So how did you get to a place where you moved from bitterness and frustration, not at anyone else, but at yourself yeah. and the game? H- how did you get out of that place? Because that's where so many people get stuck. Yeah. They're stuck in this bitter, frustrated, angry place. That, oh, the game's not treating me because I'm putting so much into the game yeah. and I'm not getting what I want out of the game. Mm. How did you let go of that and move, step into gratitude around how lucky am I? Yeah, I think well, it, I think part of it was well, nothing else is working, so why not try this? I think sometimes if you're not scoring runs for two or three innings, three or four games, I think that's where you can stick to doing the same thing. And um, I was still just feeling the same way, like I said, like, oh, how can she swing and miss and not get out? I snick off once and I'm gone. Like the game's so unlucky to me. I'm so unlucky. Blah blah blah. And then I don't know. I think I was just reflecting and just thought, well, I can't keep going this way. I'm just doing the same things and training the same way and thinking the same things and it's just not it's just not working so I've got to try something new so having that session with Amar and then changing my mindset I think I was just having a think and just to reflect um, I just remembered some of the times that I have been grateful in the past and I have struggled with anxiety and stuff previously and I remember with that that the gratitude part of it kind of negates all anxiety for me as well so just kind of went back to those kind of basics really um, as much as we go back to the cricket basics I think the the mental basics are really really key in life and a bit of perspective at the end of the day but when you say mental basics I don't think that's I think that's quite a high level thing. thought of <laughs> gratitude and you actually told me on the phone that you saw something about a- anxiety and gratitude come from the same part of the brain yeah Tell I th- us yeah that. that was a really cool um part that I had I was having um long story short I was having these seizures to do with mental health um, from all these kind of unprocessed emotions and anxiety it was coming out in a physiological state and the therapist that I was seeing at the time told me this that gratitude and anxiety come from the same part of the brain because she was getting me to do like all these writing down gratitude things and I was a bit like oh I don't really want to do all that and couldn't understand why and she said it's because gratitude and anxiety are from the same part of the brain so if you're practicing gratitude there's no space for anxiety to to actually fester and, and happen you can't do the the two same things at once and I actually tried that in one of my hundred games last year at Lords where I just sat there I was really nervous but I thought I'm now I'm opening the batting at Lords in a team that I'm having a great time at for years I've been wanting this for years like god how look like this is amazing I'm so there's 10,000 people there I just think oh my god this is amazing and then went out and and scored runs and it was just that for me it just set me just settled me just settled my nerves just kind of embracing that so I think yeah this year when I was really struggling probably lost my way with that and forgotten all about that and you look because with all the contract stuff you're thinking ahead and what's what's to come and at the same time you're not scoring runs either now so 
yeah, just going back to that kind of gratitude um, and being lucky. You still want more, you want to strive for more, but realising where you are and there's, there's worse things going on in the world, I guess. Absolutely, and I, I think I'm right in saying this scientifically, anxiety is about the thinking ahead. Yeah. And depression is about living in the past. So if you're grateful... Yeah, you you're, can't you're, think you're, of, you're, yeah. Yeah, you're, a bit, you're not thinking ahead, like you say, about, about... So you need to make sure gratitude is a practice you do every yeah. time you play because it sounds like it makes such a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. I think... I think with women's cricket as well, because you're trying to progress it all the time and we're, we're trying to fight for equality and we're trying, we want this, we want more, we want this. I think that's when you can get caught up of like, well, we've not, we've not been given this, we're not that, we're not that yet. But it's actually taking a step back and thinking, I used to pay to play cricket. I used to work all hours under the sun. Like I used to work two or three jobs and just sit, sitting back and going, this is good. Like we're in a really good spot. If you'd have told me 10 years ago that this is where you'd be today, you'd have, you'd have taken it. So yeah, I think that's probably something that's helped kept me quite grounded and and relaxed. I, I think that this gratitude is something that I've done and I'll share my story and say I think that it's something that anyone can do. 100% yeah. Regardless if you're a female professional cricket and think how lucky am I I'm getting paid. Like my personal experience was um, my wife was due to get, have, have our second child and I it was Christmas time in Perth. We had a two week break from the season and so I decided I was going to retire. Mm. And I had been underperforming for years. I'd been sort of trying too hard, sort of training hard and wanting it too much and over that Christmas period, I said to myself, why do I love playing cricket? And I started to think, I love being in the sun. I love going out to like the battle with my mates. I've got 10 mates who I go out to battle with. It's like, I love the competition with the ball. And I listed this whole sort of list of things. And for the next part of that season, mm -hmm. every week and every on the way to the ground, I was just listing things I was Days grateful like for. Yeah. I was just practicing gratitude. I, I can't wait to be in the sun today. I can't, I'm so grateful that my body works. Yeah, and you're able and to. I'm able to run around because 100%. not everyone can do that. Like, 100%. And so what happened? I had my best sort yeah. of run of form and I finished my career like on a high, on yeah. a real high from a performance sense. But I had no focus on the outcome, mm. which is completely different to where I'd been for so much of my career. Yeah. And, it, and I think there's so much power in anyone watching this. We've just recorded, I've just spent a few days with our videographer recording online content for courses. And a big part of that was the mental side of the game was mm. practicing gratitude because, and your story is amazing how you went from yeah. nowhere near playing the way yeah. you're capable of playing. Yes, a few technical shifts. Yeah sort of getting some clarity of thought but deeply just saying I'm grateful for this moment yeah, exactly. I'm grateful for this opportunity 100% there was an Instagram video as well I can't remember if I, sent, if I sent it to you I can't remember the name of it was an Aussie former cricketer I can't remember the name right now but he said about it's like chasing a butterfly like if you when you're a kid and if you're constantly trying to chase that butterfly you're never going to catch it but then if you sit there and you enjoy the park you enjoy the park bench you're just chilling and then butterfly lands on your lap and it's like that's yeah it's so cheesy and I don't normally like that kind of that stuff at all but that but obviously that time in my life that was so so true that it's like runs you just want runs all the time you want to be scoring runs but it's almost like the more you're searching for it the more you're training the more you're doing this um, when you just relax enjoy your environment be grateful for what you've got around you um, then yeah, yeah it all but comes you together say, and you say you say it's cheesy and I, I sort of think back to when I was a teenager and my mum said you got I, I think you should meditate or help you and I was like no, so, mum, yeah, that's not for doing hippies, that. not yeah. doing that. But, <laughs> but now LeBron James, one of the greatest, most successful athletes in the world, billionaire, um, had longevity is amazing. Yeah. He preaches meditation. Exactly. And, how, yeah. and these things like gratitude, like meditation, like mindfulness, all these mental skills are really, really yeah. powerful. And I think they're hard, though, for sports people who are so used to doing, like, rehab and physical things to get better. So I, if I want to get better at cricket, I will go and do I will hit balls and that will make me better. Um, same in the gym. If you want to get stronger, you lift weights. But I found the hardest thing about mindfulness and all that kind of stuff was you don't know if it's working. You You're sitting there. You yeah. Don't, yeah, you don't see it. And you just think, well, I'm, I look a bit silly here, like breathing in and breathing out, all this stuff. But like it really, really does help. And anyone listening, like just give it a go. It's not going to make you worse. I think that was one of my thought processes as well was there's no damage here to me from, from trying this. Like breathing slower is not going to make me worse. So let's just try it. And with anything, like if you want to go, we're going to go in the nets in a minute, but if any player goes to the nets, you're not going to be a master in a day. No, exactly. It's about repetition. It's about continuing to do it and building those repetitions. And then all of it, like over time, you get better at it. 100%. And if you're practicing mindfulness regularly or you're practicing your breathing and conscious breathing and mm. slot deep breathing, you can then, you get better at it, you can start tapping into it when it matters, but it doesn't just happen overnight. You can't just turn it on. No, you ha and you do have to practice. And it's weird to think, I need to practice breathing, like you do it all the time. But 
we're actually so bad at it. We're so bad at doing it properly. And I think the world we live in now and everything's so fast paced that you don't realise when you lie down at night how fast you're actually breathing. And the same when you when you've, if you've got a stressful time at work or something like that, you don't realise how how tense and stressed you are. And these deep breaths actually do help massively. Mm. Well, so much power in that part, the mental and emotional, and the, how it made an mm. impact on your on your cricket. Let's go to the physical pillar. Okay. You're very fit. You take your sort of... Well. <laughs> you were running a fair bit when we were in yeah, Perth. So tell us, tell us how important that is to you and how that looks for you. How do you manage your, your sort of your body? Yeah, well, I've had a lot of injuries throughout my career. So um, I don't think I'm blessed with kind of, my mum and dad are going to kill me for saying this, but like natural genes to, to play sport. They played a lot of sport, but they both got injured a lot. So there's a lot of issues, um, especially my knees and I'm getting older as well, obviously. So... That's where I think the fitness has to has to come in. The older you get, I think you can get away with it, and you're a bit younger. You're naturally kind of athletic, but yeah, doing those running sessions out in Perth or bike sessions, gym sessions, it just keeps you. I do it because I don't necessarily enjoy the gym, but I I enjoy cricket and I want to stay on stay on the park. And I've I've run drinks a lot in my career and I've been injured a lot in my career, so. I just want to stay on the pitch as long as I can. So that's what it's kind of all for. And that that's tapping into your why, I guess. Is yeah. It's not, I love running around an oval. It's no. not, I love lifting iron. Yeah, I don't it's, love going from cone to cone. That's not my, that's not my ideal it's session. It's going into the deeper why of why am I doing this? And I think so many mm. athlete, young athletes sometimes lack that why, lack that purpose, and then they're not able to take the action. But if you've got a deep why of, I want to play, I want to be a part yeah. of it. I, want my, I know my time's limited on the field. I want to make the most of it. It make, it helps you go out and do the work, doesn't it? Hundred percent. And I still don't think we're as a sport yet fully clued up on what the right thing to do is for cricket. I think other sports where you you play the same way as you train, um, that can be a bit easier. But cricket's so unique and so many different kind of systems used in your body. Differences in skills like batters, bowlers, spinners, keepers. All of that is different. So I think we're still finding what the right kind of physical thing to do is and I'm still still learning and that's that's probably why I still enjoy it because there's still so many new things you can do in the gym or running sessions and with all the data and stuff that's around these days um I'm learning how much I'm running in out in, in an actual game now so it's like 12 or 13 kilometers a game and then that's making me think well if I can't run 5 10k on a, on a rest day then how am I going to be able to do 13k in a game and then score runs and take wickets on top of that yeah, it's so important. It's, the, it's sort of like the foundation of your, your sort mm. of being an athlete is being physically capable. Moving on, we could keep talking, but we're yeah. going to go and have a hit in a minute. Um, <laughs> moving on to the lifestyle pillar, things yeah. like your sleep, your diet, your hydration. Mm. How important is that for you to make sure you're br- able to bring your best? Yeah, massively. So I don't, I don't really drink now at all. Um, again, as I got older, can't really cope with the, the hangovers. Um, and it's just not worth it for me in terms of the schedule that we've got with cricket. Um, if I want to have a few drinks and stuff now, I, I need three or four days before we've got anything cricket related. Um, and I get not everyone's like that, but for me, I really feel the effects on my body and I want to put cricket before that. So I'm pretty good with kind of my nutrition and, and alcohol and, and sleep and all my kind of recovery bits. I think recovery's a massive one as well. Um, I've got a, like an ice bath now at, in the garden and stuff. So all these things, I think, as, again, as I'm getting older, um, just want to keep my body in as prime shape as possible to go and play and... Yeah, I've got the Whoop band now, which is it's not an advertisement for Whoop. Other bands are available, but um, this has been really, really good for cricket as you can wear it when we play and you get to see all your recovery and all, so many data insights that I love. And I'm a bit of a cricket geek and a te- technical geek anyway. So, yeah, I like all the all the insight. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I've got my Whoop on yeah. as well. Uh, <laughs> never comes off. Um, so what do you tell us about how you get some balance in your life? Like balance is a word people use. You are with a cricket person, your yeah. partner, Tom, who we've spoken <laughs> about. You guys live and breathe cricket. I saw we that when we were together in Perth. How do you get away from the game? Um, we don't get much time away from it, I'm not going to lie. Um, but we enjoy it so much. So I think the main thing is just switching off and having downtime. Like I'm trying to get back into reading and things like that. Stuff that doesn't necessarily involve my, my phone too much. I've been trying to get into some social media content as well. And I think that kind of what we spoke about before about inspiring the next generation like I kind of see that as a little bit of a side hobby as well and creating content for people out there and that's so it's still cricket a little bit but you can do it from kind of your home um and then yeah for me just spending time with time with friends and family I think we're away so much with cricket that my downtime is just catching up with people and, and checking in and seeing how how they're doing so you don't often get much time for it but when you do it's great and next topic is the best players in the world. You've played with, you've played against the best players in the world. 
What are some common traits you've seen in um, in some of those best players you've seen? Um, I say the main one is the ability to stay level. I'd say with success and failure. Um, but that's something I'm obviously trying to to do, not get too too low with stuff. But yeah, I'm thinking kind of. I think Phoebe Litchfield is is great. I'm going to be playing with her again the next few weeks. But she was so kind of consistent off the pitch. Um, Sorry, my mic's just moving up. Same, moving yeah. In the wind. That's right. Same kind of. It's an outside, yeah, it's outside, outside natural podcast. setting. Yeah. Um, Nats of a Brent as well. Like, I think you wouldn't be able to tell when she came off whether she scored a hundred or got out for a duck. She's so kind of calm and relaxed, and I think that's a really, for me anyway, that's a a nice place to be and something I've probably looked up to for them. Absolutely, and something I talk to our young athletes about is not riding the roller coaster, yeah. not being so high when you're doing well and then really low, which is more often, right? Yeah, is 100%, especially not, in cricket. <laughs> yeah, exactly, not living on that roller coaster. Um, let's talk about captaincy. Yeah. You captained Warwickshire to a title back in Did, 2019. Yeah. Very congratulations. Thank um, you. What do you think it is about captaincy and leadership that makes a good leader? I think communication is 100% the, the main one and not just not just saying you're good at communicating or you like communication but actually acting on it um, and that for me means kind of constantly speaking to each member of the team and, and making sure they're clear and, and sometimes it means not being liked as well. I think you've got to kind of bear that in mind that you're not going to be everyone's friend, that you can't please everybody out of 11. Naturally some people are going to be disappointed. Um, and that's probably one of the harder things when you do it socially as well. If you're doing it at a club level or even county wasn't professional, so trying to maintain friendships off the pitch and then making some difficult decisions on is harder. Um, but yeah, I think just communicating probably why you're doing things, what you're doing um, and how you're going to get your team to succeed. Yeah, amazing. And that's that's hard. I found that hard because I'm a people pleaser yeah. and I like keeping everyone happy yeah. and so as a captain yeah sometimes you're going to make a tough call when it might be your mates you yeah know. but it's how you communicate that decision at the end of the day and I've probably not got that right a lot of the time and I think part of it is owning up to your mistakes as well I really respect our head coach Chris Guest he's one of the one of the only coaches I've worked with that's a head coach that does admit when they're wrong um, and then looks to change things and improve for the better I think there's been a lot of old school coaching where it's my way or the highway um, and that's just it whereas I do I do think if you can admit you might have got things wrong, um, but then move on and, and try and improve, then I think that's great. And that's amazing because that, that takes a strong person to admit they're 100%. wrong, admit to a mistake and be vulnerable. Yeah. And players relate to that, don't they? 100%. I think if you try to kind of, as a captain, pretend that you're invincible or everything that you say is, is right and blah, 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 blah then, then yeah, I think you lose the respect of, of your players. But I think if you admit that you can get some things, so you're only human at the end of the day, but everything you're doing is for the, for the best of the team. If you've got that wrong, then then you've got it wrong. Now, we're going to have to finish up in a minute, but before we do, when we spoke a few weeks ago, yeah. you told me you had a very cool experience with one of the game's greatest. Tell us about that. I did. So I went to Sachin Tendulkar's house Amazing. in London, um, which was, yeah, incredible. It was through Tom, um, through Saka. So his son Arjun was playing for, for Saka this year, and there's a few other projects behind the scenes. So um, I, thankfully, was playing at Lords the next day anyway, so I don't think I was actually invited, but... I was in London anyway, um, and yeah, we got to go to his house and went for tea and a few cakes, and it was, we watched the cricket, I think the tea, the World Cup was on, we watched India play, and I was just sat there next to... How was Sachin he? What, did you pick his brain, or how was it? I actually it? said to Tom afterwards, like, he just looked like Sachin Tendulkar, do you know what I mean? He was, he was right there, he was, yeah, picked his brains loads, we talked about, obviously, the game that was on at the time, and he gave me that advice of, um, just speak to as many people as you can in, in cricket, and you don't have to listen to everything they say, but just talk cricket like talk to anyone you can um, and, and the runs will come but yeah we just it was just nice just to chill with it didn't get a picture or anything I was too kind of fangirl didn't in or yeah it was just mad um, but really really cool and he was really lovely yeah amazing amazing well we have to finish up but before we do where can people follow you on my Instagram, Marie Kelly ninety six, um, and my TikTok, Marie Kelly Cricket. There you go, Marie's <laughs> becoming an influencer. Yeah, I'm quite old, so I'm not quite used to the kind of TikTok vibe, but we're trying it. We'll go. For Very it. good. And now let's final question. Let's fast forward ten years from now. Mm -hmm. We're sitting here. What would you like to have achieved over the next ten years? What do you think is a? What are you striving for moving forward? Well, obviously, I'd still love to play for my country, but um, that might be a little bit out of reach. But I think just. I don't think at the minute, and I think it's where my lack of confidence kind of comes from, is I don't think I score as many runs as I could do and should do. So I would love to just increase that over the next three, four, five years um, and just be the best player I can be and know that when I retire, 
Um, I've scored as many runs as I think I should do and could do. Um, and hopefully all this kind of mental and everything off the pitch will help me achieve that. And then millions of followers along yeah. the way. <laughs> Lots of subscribers on my Instagram. <laughs> Legend, thank you for your thank time. You. I know you've got a busy schedule. We're going to go yeah. and have a hit now. So, guys, there was so much value there. We were a little bit rushed because of the schedules, but great to catch up uh, here in Bradford and all the best for the rest, for the 100, yeah. for the rest of this English season and beyond. So, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode or any of our content, then please do me a big favour and subscribe to our channel. The more subscribers we get, the bigger the guests we can get on and continue to help you on your journey of becoming the best you can be.